Uh, good evening, councillors, officers and public viewers. Uh, welcome to this additional meeting of the Audit and Standards Committee. Councillors and officers are reminded to put their mobile phones or electric, electronic device on silent if they have one near them. Those present in the room should face forwards towards their microphones and speak directly into them and not place papers or electronic devices between themselves and the microphones. Please press the nearest button to you on the microphone when you wish to speak, unless otherwise indicated. Uh, for remote participants, uh, please mute your microphones when not speaking, as this will reduce feedback, background noise, and save bandwidth to prevent loss of connection. Members of the Council and independent persons joining us remotely should leave their cameras on. Officers should leave cameras on only for the agenda item you are speaking to. After each item has been presented, uh, members and independent persons present in the room will be invited to ask questions on that. Those members and independent persons joining us remotely will then be invited to speak. They should indicate they wish to do so by using the raise your hand facility. Only those members of the Audit and Standards Committee present in the room will be making the decisions. Uh, the results will be confirmed verbally for the benefit of those watching the webcast. I now step aside in favour of the Chief Executive. Thank you, Councillor. Um, as members are aware, the, the, um, we'll get to it in a moment, the Chairman has given his apologies for this evening, so therefore we need to nominate someone to chair this meeting. So do uh, I have any nominations for chairing the meeting? Councillor Hong. I'd like to nominate Councillor Paul Cortell. I think the experience will be good for him. And I'd like to formally second. Thank you. Have we, have we, any, have we any other nominations? Councillor Cortell, I think that we can take that as unanimous. So uh, I was going to say, I'm delighted to make to uh, offer you the chair of the meeting. Thank you, Chief Executive. Um, we move on now to agenda item one, which is the minutes of the last meeting. Um, does anyone have any concerns about the accuracy of the minutes? Um, Councillor Harmer. Um, just thought I'd point this out. Um, I propose an addition to the minutes of the last meeting, of the last doors and standards on the 21st of March. If I'm correct in thinking, uh, the independent person raised the issue of actions arising from the minutes, and um, he referred to two actions from the previous meeting that weren't on that agenda, and I think he, it was discussed that it came back here. Um, one was about setting up a subcommittee to monitor the housing company, and the other concerned the audit manager's responsibility for risk management. And uh, Councillor G on our chair at that time stated that he thought it was something that we could take forward um, and introduce. So I just wondered where we were with that, if it could amend a minute or how that, how that actually works. Um, well, I would support adding a note to the minutes um, along the lines of what you stated, uh, Councillor Harmer. I think it's a very useful addition. Um, do we have a seconder for Councillor Harmer? Uh, Councillor Maidley, um, I defer to the Chief Executive. Thank you, Chair. Um, ju just to clarify, the housing company will be on the agenda of the next meeting. This was actually an extra meeting put in, um, so hence why um, th th those items, I would imagine, haven't been, because it will go to the next usual meeting, if that's not that this is an unusual meeting, it's just an extra meeting. I think um, Councillor Harmer's point was about the fact that it had been raised 
and possibly should be included in the minutes. That is all. That's correct. Just just in the minute that it had actually been mentioned that it could be minuted, so that you know we talk about so many things, it could sometimes pass, and I personally could forget about it. Thank you, Councillor Harmer. Um, is the meeting in favour of adding that point to the minutes? I have noticed my raised hand. Uh, Councillor Barnes. Yes, I was just going to comment. I have no objection to taking the next meeting. Uh, but uh, you and I had a conversation earlier today, and uh, I thought it worthwhile just putting on record again why it has to be a subcommittee and can't be handled by prejudicial uh, declarations. Because if you declare a prejudicial, uh, you have to leave the room. That means that the chairman and vice chairman will not be available uh, for any questioning by the committee. And we can only get down that, I think, by having a subcommittee, which is why I would hope on the next agenda there is a motion to appoint a subcommittee uh, to uh, deal with our audit of uh, the what I think is now going to be called underwriter housing. Uh, thank you, Councillor Barnes. Um, I'm sure that will be discussed in detail at the June meeting. Um, the issue is simply at the moment about the accuracy of the minutes. But uh, you've made a very valid point. Thank you. Do, do we agree the minutes with the, the, that addition requested by Councillor Harmer? In favour, yes. Okay, that's unanimous. Thank you. I will now sign the minutes. Agenda item two, apologies for absence. Um, I have apologies from Councillor Gia Wan, uh, Councillor Mrs Kirby Green, um, our independent person Patrick Farmer, our senior officers Lorna Ford and Ben Hook. Are there any other apologies? Okay, thank you. Um, agenda item three, Additional agenda items. I believe there are none. Would that be correct, uh, Chief Executive? Yes, that is correct, Chairman. Thank you. Um, agenda item four is disclosures of interest. Um, do any councillors, either uh, in the chamber or remotely, have a declaration of interest about anything in this meeting tonight? I Take it, I ought to declare my vice for Rothers Housing Company is going to be called. Thank you, uh, Councillor Barnes. Uh, Councillor. I may have to disclose because of the business grants are in the report and I have a business and I have received a business grant. And as chairman of the Lands Homes and Derrida, as it's going to be. Thank you, Councillor Thomas. That's everybody. Okay. Thank you. Um, we can now move on to the substantive parts of the meeting. Um, our first speaker is Kelly Watson of CCLA, our property investment fund managers. And um, I will ask our Chief Finance Officer, Tony Baden, to introduce her. Thank you, Chair, and good evening, members. Um, so just a, bit, a little bit of background for, for everyone. We, uh, we did commit to um, providing a, a, a sort of training session for members. We've got um, the Council investment about £5 million pounds with the CCLA, uh, which is a significant sum of money. And I thought it would be helpful for members to understand the actual performance of, uh, of that investment uh, and what the issues may be going forward. And Kelly and uh, has 
that's very helpfully produced a, a, um, a presentation for, for us to, to look at tonight. Uh, Kelly is our relationship manager and she's assisted, so she's with um, Heather Lamont, who's the director for client investments at CCLA as well. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to Kelly and I hope members find the uh, presentation very helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony, and thank you very much, Chair. Um, it's fantastic to, to be with you all, and thank you all very much for accommodating uh, this slight change. I was hoping to be with you in person, but under current circumstances, can't be able to. So thank you ever so much. Um, just to, Can somebody just say yes, please, that you can see the presentation in front of you? Yes, I can. Wonderful. OK, that's brilliant. Hopefully it won't slow down on me too much. Uh, so I'm here with with my colleague Heather <clears throat> and uh, what we will do is just just introduce ourselves very briefly. And <clears throat> excuse me, should apologise if I have a little bit of a, a frog in my throat every now and then. So <clears throat> just going to run us through now. I'm not sure where my presentation is going. It might be going a little bit slow technology wise, but hopefully if I maybe turn my camera off because you don't need to see me while we are talking. Um, so my name is Kelly Watson. Uh, I am your relationship manager at CCLA. So I'm that the, the main person that, that, I, that you would speak to if you have any queries or, or anything. So I have regular catch ups with the team at Rother. And um, my background before joining CCLA is largely local government. So I've worked in public and private sector organisations. But prior to joining Rother, I was a Section 151 officer um, in district council. And I have worked in a number of different councils over, over a number of years. But that's uh, where I come from. So my background is local government. I have treasury management consultancy experience uh, and just other relevant experience that, that leads me to, to the role that I'm in today. Um, so I'm going to just ask Heather to introduce herself. By all means, uh, Kelly, are you meant to be? Uh, we're still on the front page as far as I can see on my screen. Oh, there we go. Well done. <laughs> so, yeah. so, yeah, I'm. Hi, everybody. Good evening. Thank you for welcoming us. Yeah, I'm Heather. Um, I originally trained, trained as a chartered accountant. Um, that was quite a long time ago, about 30 years ago when I qualified. Uh, most of my career I've been in investment management and uh, I've been with CCLA since 2008. So coming up for 14 years. That's probably all you need to know about me. <laughs> Thanks, Heather. So I'm just going to take you briefly through a bit of background around CCLA, hand over to Heather just to talk to you about the fund that you are invested in. And then I'll just finish up with a couple of examples. So we're, we're going to not take up too much of your time and then open up for some questions. So CCLA, for those of you that aren't aware, CCLA stands for Churches, Charities and Local Authorities. So we are predominantly a public sector, not for profit investment manager. We have been around for a very long time. So our origins go back right back to the 1950s. And we have over 35,000 clients across all of those sectors. And as a collective, as an organisation, we manage over 14 billion pounds. If we then scale that into the local government, local authority uh, side of the business, the LA part, we have over 750 local authorities. And it does include around 400 town and parish councils. So we cover and serve local authorities of all shapes and sizes. And actually, we have some organisations who are quite unusual when it comes to public sector organisations. So we, that includes things like national parks, internal drainage authorities, uh, coast uh, port and harbour authorities, as well as a, an, an inter international governmental organisation based at Jodrell Bank. So we have all sorts of public sector bodies, but predominantly local authorities right across all nations of the UK. <coughs> Excuse me. So we have three particular funds that we manage for local authorities. We have a lot more across the business for the other sectors as well. But the ones in the local authority arena are a public sector deposit fund, a diversified income fund. So we have two different kinds of funds there, one which is a daily instant access cash fund and another which is a multi asset fund. But the one that we're here to talk to you about today is the local authorities property fund. So it's just to mention that we do have those other funds that other local authorities are invested as well. 
One thing I do think is really important to mention is that CCLA is a slightly different kind of investment manager in that we could be considered as effectively a mutual in terms of the organisation and how we are structured. So the, the LA part of the business, um, all parts have a similar structure, but the LA part is owned by what's known as the Local Authorities Mutual Investment Trust. So this is an organisation, uh, a board that sits above part of CCLA and looks into overseeing the way that the, the um, business manages public sector money. And that board has members of the local government association appointed to it. So what we have is councillors from the local government sector who sit on our board. That board then supports the private sector organisation, CCLA as the investment manager, to manage money for the public sector. So we have that effectively a mutual um, focus, which we think is incredibly important and something that, that we make sure we utilise, that we have that we have that sector insight and sector oversight over the organisation. <clears throat> so we have, as mentioned, over 750 organisations, all different types, shapes and sizes right across all of the devolved nations. And the picture in front of you just tries to illustrate, almost looks a bit of a, a multicoloured blob now, uh, but tries to illustrate that we do have clients right across the whole length and breadth of the UK. <clears throat> so the Local Authorities Property Fund, I'll just give a bit of an introduction and hand over to Heather. So the fund has been around for a very long time, um, but we have had considerable growth in this particular fund, uh, probably in the last 12 years. It is a fund that has been designed for and is specifically for local authorities. So it's the Local Authorities Property Fund. Uh, it is a professionally managed fund. And one thing that that we like to make sure we uh, let people know about is that we are an active manager. So we make sure that we are doing something all the time with the assets that we hold. We are always working on the assets. We are always working with the tenants. We are always active. Um, and that's something that we pride ourselves in doing. And is something that has, has supported us with our consistent uh, and successful approach to the way that we have managed the property fund over a very considerable number of years. We don't focus specifically on any particular geographical area of the country. Um, what we do is we make sure that we have a focus on specific assets, that we focus on the way that asset is managed, that it's the right asset, that it has future uses, and that we know that we can actually make the most of that asset. And it is something that will complement the rest of the portfolio. <clears throat> it is a commercial UK property portfolio. And I mentioned that it has that independent oversight from the, the Local Authorities Mutual Investment Trust, LAMIT. Over the last few years, and particularly over the last five, it has seen some strong growth. And the unit holder base has actually been stable. One thing that um, other um, organisations or other fund managers have experienced in, in a number of different ways has been some volatility in the uh, uh, the unit holders that they have. In terms of the local authority property fund, we have had a lot of stability. We didn't have any organisations that chose to redeem or to move out of the property fund during the pandemic. Actually, what we saw was the reverse of that. We continued to receive some money into the into the property fund during 2020 and also into 2021. And that has continued into 2022. So the fund has been increasing, not just by value, but also by the amount that people are putting into the fund. So it is something that has uh, been quite stable over the last couple of years, despite what has happened uh, in terms of it from a market perspective. So I said that we had 750 local authorities. Specifically for the Local Authorities Property Fund, we have 256 in the fund at the moment, and they do cover the whole range of local authorities, right from some smaller town and parish councils up to very, very large uh, principal authorities. So I'm going to rest on my voice there and hand over to Heather to take us through some next next slides. Well, thanks very much. Okay, so um, yes, indeed. So I'll just tell you a little bit more about how we manage the fund and what we're trying to do with it. Um, and indeed, why use property as an asset class at all? And one of the things that we find about property as an asset class, as indeed some other asset classes is the case, is we would say it's 
inefficient. So we regard assets as having an intrinsic value, which we can assess um, the market. The, the price that the market assigns to that uh, asset at any one time may well be out of line with what we see as the asset's fundamental value. So it may be overvalued or undervalued by the market. And therein lies the opportunity for us to, for example, access to, to purchase assets which we think are undervalued. The market hasn't perhaps recognised their potential. We can bring that full potential out. That supports the fund with good rental flows, but it also supports the capital values by because by improving the buildings, by securing a much more attractive rental stream, that in itself increases the valuation that the market will assign to those properties. So it grows the capital as well as just targeting income. So as Kelly, I think, suggested, you were, we're active managers. It's not just about buying and selling properties. There is a bit of that that goes on, of course. Um, but really, most of the work of the team in-house, we have the team of, uh, they're all called uh, chartered surveyors by profession, based in CCLA. And most of the work that they do is about it's working with the existing tenants or finding new tenants for the existing properties and indeed improving and developing the properties that we have to make sure that they're kept up to the top standards so that we can attract the best tenants. So um, when I say uh, inefficiency in the market, in the market as a whole, we you will be familiar with some types of asset um, within the property sector. So retail, your high street shops, for example, but also things that we would describe as uh, retail warehouses. So often those sort of big out of town stores like you know, the B&Qs and computer centres and people like that. Um, and uh, you know, sofa showrooms, all sorts of things like that. Um, Industrial is another very important subsector, as we'll be seeing, um, perhaps has echoes or would have had echoes many years ago of things like factories. In practice, the industrial subsector these days is much more likely to be uh, distribution warehouses, the sorts of places that online retailers uh, have at, you know, at the edge of a big motorway junction, um, sending things out that people have ordered online. So um, industrials. Retail, retail warehouses and the other subsector that we routinely talk about is offices. So the portfolio is made up of a mix of these uh, of these uh, different subsectors. There are around about 75 properties in total, but the portfolio doesn't look like the market as a whole. So when we say asset allocation is critical in one of my bullet points here, we're looking to find the, the growth areas, the areas where we think there are far better opportunities than the areas where there are far fewer opportunities. Um, so in traditional high street retail, for example, not controversially, I expect we find it much harder to find the opportunities. Um, so we we're underweight, as we would say, we don't have so much in that sector as you would find reflected in the market as a whole. Conversely, in the industrial sector, those online the, you know, the distribution warehouses uh, and similar assets, we have relatively high proportions of those. And even within a sector like the office sector, for example, um, again, lots of changes, lots of talk about what's COVID done for offices. Um, yes, changes in the way people are working, absolutely coming to the fore. But in fact, these are typically trends that were already in place. Things like the move to working from home, more flexible working, differences in the sorts of offices that people want to use and where they want to be in offices. Um, so the, the COVID and the pandemic has accentuated and probably accelerated some of these trends. But there are trends that were already in place that we were reflecting in the portfolio. So the sorts of offices within that sector that we like you know, will reflect um, our views on the changing market. And the other thing I wanted to mention just before we move in, very important for us that the returns are sustainable. You're a long term investor. It's a fund for long term investment allocations. So it's important that the returns that we can produce from the portfolio are sustainable and environmental, social and governance factors are a very important part of that. So I think Kelly will be coming back for Kelly to talk a bit more about that um, shortly. So let's just go on to the next slide, Kelly. And look at here, we're looking at the property sector as a whole. So not the fund. This is what's happened to property investors over um, the last few years. We could go back actually over many more years. We're just looking back to 2016 here. But there are a couple of things about the pattern of returns from the property market. This is why people like to, in, to allocate 
part of your uh, part of your reserves to the property sector because of the sorts of returns that it can produce. Now, we often think about the income stream from property, and that's the the yellow bit in each of these sticks here. Um, and the nice thing about income as a component of investment returns because it's, it's always positive um, in the case of property it's a good deal more attractive than you would get from many other assets certainly way way more than you would get from from any interest income that you, you would receive on cash so that's an important reason why people like it and it's relatively steady as an income stream um, but the other part of investment returns from property is of course the capital movement so how much does the value go up by over time. Now, this certainly doesn't happen at an even pace. So if you look at the blue component of each of these uh, sticks here, you can see, yes, sometimes capital values have fallen. Surprise, surprise. We had quite a bit of that going on in 2019, 2019 and 2020 um, as as investors got very wary of the market. So properties were going for lower prices or being valued at lower prices. Now, it didn't mean that the income wasn't still coming in. Your rental is sort of independent element of the returns from that. And over time, although, yes, there are downturns as well, but over time, those up periods in the capital value can certainly be expected to outnumber the down period. So over time, and you get echoes of this, of course, in the residential property market, over time, you expect your house to go up in value more than it will go down. We find the same in the commercial property sectors. That really is why people think it's a good idea to have some allocation to this asset class. Good way of boosting the returns that you have to spend on your work. But it does need that relatively long commitment to a, to a fairly extended time horizon because those returns, if we look at the total returns, won't come at an even pace. So that's sort of a, why you might invest in property as a whole. If we go on to the next slide, this is looking at the fund. So back to the fund that you are, are invested in. Um, and seeing how this compares to uh, well, roughly how the fund shapes up um, and then how it compares to the market as a whole. So the left hand pie chart there, this is the blend of the fund across those different subsectors that I mentioned. So shops that you know, just 2.2 percent, that traditional um, high street, high street retail, if you like, um, so really quite a small part of the portfolio, much more significant allocations, as I also mentioned, to things like the industrial industrial sector, that pink slice of the pie, uh, and offices, um, about a third of the portfolio. Um, and then the, the chart along the bottom there, that bar chart, shows you how those allocations compare to the market as a whole. So if we just take the, the left-hand pair of sticks, for example, that's shops, but particularly in the southeast of England, you can see the, you know, the funds allocation, as we would say, to that part of the market is a good deal lower than the corresponding gray stick, which is, is, is immediately next to it. So and uh, conversely, if we go out about three quarters of the way along towards the right, industrial properties outside of the southeast, the fund has we have more of those sorts of properties than is the case for for the market as a whole. So that's what we mean when we say asset allocation is important and we're focusing on the sectors where there are the opportunities to add value and to bring you those good returns from the portfolio. Um, then this right hand pie chart is telling us a bit about the how long the leases um, of the tenants in the portfolio and the properties in the portfolio have to have to, to still to run. And um, you can't necessarily see how this compares to the market as a whole. Um, but we actually quite like you see nearly half of the portfolio. That blue chunk there is port from the leases which have less than five years less to run. And in fact, I know that many of those have a good deal less than five, a good deal less than five years left to run, um, which for us, uh, for some people would think this is risky. You know, I, I don't want to know I'm going to have to go and get a new tenant in 18 months time or a year or two years time. Um, we actually quite like properties where the short where there are short tenancies remaining, because this is where our opportunity comes to develop and improve the properties and add value. So we're quite commonly will find a property that we think, mm, yeah, well, but the property is great or it could be great. We're not so keen on the tenants. Um, let's take the property on. Um, we know that those tenants are going to be moving out. That's where our opportunity comes to improve the buildings and lots, lots of examples of how this has worked in the portfolio. Um, so we suddenly have a better building. We can attract tenants with more resilient and more resilience 
to pay those continuing rents and very often at higher rents. So the rental growth in the portfolio often comes from improvements in the building that we've been able to bring about because we're willing to take on relatively short uh, short lease properties. Um, you can see a couple of other points. I'll just draw your attention to one or two other things then um, on that chart. So the pink slice there um, in that right hand pie chart, it's, that's described as investment voids as opposed to um, development voids. Um, so development voids are where we are actually working to develop the property. Um, so uh, actually improving it. Investment voids are where potentially there could be a tenant in there. So it is, would be available for lease, but we're not letting it out. Now, of course, in a couple of cases, that might be because you, we haven't yet got the right tenant or you know, they're not in place. But actually, very often it's because we're in a we're working on a property. It might be a multi let property with lots of different tenants in and we're on the verge or expecting in due course to uh, perhaps sell that property with a change of use uh, that will make it a lot more valuable property. So in the meantime, part of it is empty because there are a couple of leases left to run. So that's a fl little flavour of uh, what the portfolio looks like. Um, just going on to the next slide, because I've already talked about, you know, we're looking for good tenants, if you like, tenants with robust businesses. That by definition, they're, you know, they're, it's commercial property. So the businesses that we're talking about you know, who are going to be good for the rent. So we, we look at this in lots of different ways and in you know, much more granular ways than suggested here. But one of the things that we look at is how are they rated by Dun and Bradstreet? You may be familiar with these uh, Dun and Bradstreet to rate different businesses um, on the, the quality of what their standards might be as uh, as credit uh, as debtors. Um, so and again, you can't see how this compares to the market as a whole, but you can see most of uh, most of the portfolio there that dark grey, there's the grey slice there, the darker grey slice, well, more, yes, more than two thirds of the portfolio are lower than average risk. So you know, that, that's one of the things that we like and are able to attract good quality tenants. And in fact, it's one of the things that significantly helped us during the pandemic when you know, a lot of businesses were struggling or would struggle to pay the rent. Um, we had you know, one or two, actually, we had more people who, you know, <coughs> didn't pay when they could pay. Um, but generally speaking, and that's that's actually now been been resolved um, as, as we've emerged from the pandemic. Uh, but really, the returns, the income returns into the portfolio held up pretty well, a lot better than many, many funds would have experienced. So that's one of the things that we like is to have good quality tenants as well. So um, let's just go on to look a bit at the numbers that you've been experiencing. So this is the yield, the income yield. So this is just the income element of returns that we're talking about on this slide, not the capital returns. Um, the blue stick is the funds percentage yield. And then the gray stick in each of these cases is what's been the case in the property fund market as a whole. So you can see consistently the percentage yields that the fund's been delivering has been a good deal higher, significantly higher than the market as a whole. Um, and again, as a reminder, a great deal more than, than you would experience in cash. So this just reminds us of the reason um, why it's very important, why a lot of people choose to allocate part of their funds to a property fund such such as this. Um, you can't see from this, but we are talking about percentages here. Um, where we see the, 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 the looks of the income hasn't uh, hasn't gone up all the time. It's actually very often the income has gone up, even if the percentage has come down. And that can be the case. Um, you can be paying out or receiving the same number of pounds in rent. But if the value of the portfolio has gone up at times of rising capital values, then, of course, as a percentage that would have fallen. Um, but a very good track record, actually, of, of delivering uh, good returns in income terms, that income flow coming to you, um, as Tony, Tony has no doubt let you know, um, has been quite consistent, um, uh, on top of which over the long term you expect to get some capital growth. So if we go on to the next slide, we can look at not just the income, but on this slide we're looking at the total returns from the fund um, over the last five years. And uh, the blue stick again being the fund's total return, the grey stick being property funds, the comparator that we use, the property market, property fund market as a whole. Um, and again, we're reminded here that they 
returns don't come at an even pace and the une unevenness is really due to movement in prices much more than it's due to changes in the income flows um, but over the long term again far more ups than downs so this is where we're fairly confident you should expect as a long-term investor that you will see capital growth the value of your holding will rise um, and just before i hand back to kelly the table on the second half of this page is just giving you the you the annualized figures over the one, one, three, five, and 10 years, again, comparing that to the comparator benchmark. So the fund really has a pretty good track record of um, delivering these total returns um, over and above what the average property fund investor is experiencing. And of course, also within that, the income element higher than what most investors are experiencing. So I'm going to hand back to Kelly now to talk a bit more about responsible investment. Thank you, Thank you very, if very voice, much. If your voice is holding up all right, Kelly. It is, it actually, is actually, surprisingly. Thank you very, very much. Um, so just to finish up, hopefully a couple of minutes more of your time. Um, so responsible investment is something that isn't just part of the property fund. It's actually part of everything that CCLA does. So it's at the core and it, it there's a theme that it flows through almost every conversation that we actually have as a business. It's It's quite incredible when you're sort of in the organisation, seeing just how fundamental it is and and how much it is it is actually intrinsic within the organisation itself. In terms of the property fund, there are a number of things that we do, some of them that you, as you would expect, are standard. So we do go through a huge amount of due diligence, understanding things like flood risk, contaminated land and how that might impact or or what we might need to do as an active manager. Um, there's things that we do um, whether it's actually looking at the initial purchase of a property, whether it's the improvements to the properties we go through, working with the working with tenants. And that's making sure that no matter what we do, we are always doing something to improve the property, improve the way that we can work with our tenants, whether that's through improved energy <coughs> ratings, the waste uh, processes that we have within the building, water performance. That could be things like uh, the way that actually uh, carbon efficiency of the of the building there's all sorts of different examples but we always are looking to do something that has an improvement we are working very closely with all of our tenants and we've been doing over quite a long period of time rolling out what's known as a green lease clause and what this allows us to do is work a lot more closely with uh, with tenants particularly where we have multi multi-let buildings so whereas being the owner of a building, you can get into the sort of into the entrance area, but actually the tenants then have uh, the ability to you know, basically exclude you from the, their part of the building that they're renting. A green lease allows us to do a lot more than that. It allows us to have a lot more conversations, actually build that sort of win win conversation with the with the tenants. So whether that's we want to put in um new carbon efficient or energy efficient uh, windows, uh, um, roofing, whatever it might be. Actually, that has an impact from our perspective on capital values, but has an impact on the tenant that it should hopefully reduce their running costs, their energy use, that kind of thing. So it's, it's always making sure that we can have some kind of win win, but actually enable that conversation in the first place. Um, any refurbishment we do is always sympathetic. I've <clears throat> got a number of examples that I'd love to take you through today, but we haven't got quite enough time. Um, always making sure that the energy performance is better than the benchmark. And we go through a huge amount of work um, on tenant screening. So Heather touched on sort of Dun & Bradstreet and the assessments, the financial ability for them to continue to pay their rent. But it does go a lot further than that. It does actually look at what they're doing, the kind of organisation that it is, what they do, um, the impact that they have, um, as well as sort of looking into their history. So there's a number of things that we do <clears throat> to make sure that responsible investment does continue to be core to everything we do. And as well as sort of, you know, we can talk about it, um, we can sort of walk you through the processes, but actually we do get ourselves externally assessed just to try and demonstrate that external validation. It's not just us talking about it. We we do actually do this. And so we get we get uh, rated by the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment. And across the, the categories that are applicable to CCLA, we have been awarded a plus. Um, and that's not just a one off that has been consistently. And it's not something that's easy to get. It's uh, it's worth saying. So just to just to finish, I've got three properties here and I do apologize. I could talk about these phrases so I'll be as quick as I possibly can. This is my favourite bit of any presentation. Uh, 
we've got a, a property here that is owned by the property fund and it is in a it's now known as Midtown, which feels very strange to be calling Midtown an area of London. Hopefully we're not trying to sort of Americanize everything that we do, but but it's sort of just outside of central London. And this is just on the other side of Covent Garden. And so this particular building, we did some very uh, sympathetic refurbishment and there were a few things that we did. So we saw that this property had particularly it was in an attractive area, had the ability to continue with the working with the tenants that were there. But actually, one thing that um, our team did do was just move the doors around. So they made the back door, the front door and the front door, the back door. So what that meant was that the uh, postcode that was attached to this particular building became a Covent Garden postcode. So it became a much more attractive asset that attracted a much higher rental. And actually, we were able to, to rent out and let this building for a much higher rent than we had been uh, receiving previously. We had an increase in, in valuations uh, during that time. Um, and actually, it wasn't particularly impacted through COVID. So this is a, an office building that's in a, an attractive area and one actually that is still in demand. So it's, it's one of those a, a good news office story, which we're really, really, really pleased about. <clears throat> Just briefly touch on an industrial asset that we do have. Uh, so we have a, a sort of a, a, a lovely looking building, let's be honest. Um, very, very attractive. Um, I think there's probably definitely more attractive buildings out there. But actually, it does show that actually it doesn't have to be an attractive building. If it's something that is in demand, and this particular asset is in the area of London that it's in near the North Circular, purchased for £7 million back in 2014. And one thing that we have seen over not just the pandemic, but actually slightly before all of these trends being accelerated and the move to sort of logistical, industrial, that kind of thing. We like this asset. It already was in an attractive location, um, already had other uses in the future, which is definitely something that, that we looked at. But one thing we have had recently is some off market approaches for things like a, an international data centre, uh, major industrial developers wanting to do something with this particular um, area. But actually, one thing we also do with these being an active manager, we always want to make sure that we can um, future proof our assets. So this particular asset, as well as being in a good area for transport links, it is also in an area that could be in the future residential, depending on what happens with the markets. So there's a number of different things that we've got with this, but actually a really good asset that has increased significantly in capital value over the last sort of two to three years. And the final one I just want to touch on, um, we own two travel lodges within the property property fund. One is actually uh, not too far away from where you all are in Brighton. So on the front there. So if anyone knows the travel lodge, you can walk past at some point if you have a visit down there and say, well, that's in the property fund. Um, and the other one that we've got is here at, at Tower Bridge. We've had this in the portfolio for a little while. Um, very strong uh, tenant. But actually, the reason I like to show this one is because during the pandemic, Travelodge undertook a CVA. So they went through a financial restructure. Um, and as a result of that, they, they graded uh, all their hotel properties from A to, I'm not sure what letter they went down to, to be honest, but sort of A, B, C, D, E. <clears throat> Those that were rated the highest received 100% of their rental income. And actually, as their sort of gradings went down, they received a, a different percentage um, that they would be due. Our two uh, travel lodges that we do own received 100 percent of their income. So while travel lodge themselves were perceived to be in a, in a difficult position while they were undertaking this financial restructure, our two hotels did receive all of that rental income. We have actually during that period been able to increase the rent um, and the valuation did also increase. But again, as well as having a good asset in a good location, what we also make sure is that where this is, it is very attractive from a residential point of view um, and actually also from an office point of view, given its location in London. So it does have future uses. Um, again, being an active manager, it's something that we always want to make sure we are looking at good asset, good location, future potential um, to make sure that we can we can continue to provide that sustainable income over time. I'm going to stop there because I have got other properties, but I'm conscious of time. I don't want to take up too much of your time. So I'll stop sharing the presentation for now and I'm um, happy to take any questions. 
Uh, I'd like to say thank you, Kelly and Heather. That was extremely enlightening. And it certainly gives me a great deal of confidence in having you as uh, property investment fund managers. Um, I'll um, invite questions. Uh, first of all, uh, do our officers have anything they wish to say? Uh, no, Chair. It was a presentation for um, members' benefits rather than rather than our own. Um, <clears throat> as I think Kelly mentioned at the beginning of her presentation, we've uh, we've had uh, quite a lot of contact with uh, CCLA, and they've taken us through this sort of presentation uh, several times before. I think there's some interesting slides in there, um, which resonate with some of the um, uh, reports that we've taken to committee before, uh, particularly around the uh, the increase in capital value of our our investments because. Uh, I, I think the slow is on page seven or page eight, something like that. But um, if you notice that the, I think it's two, quarter three of 2021, I think it was, uh, the capital value of our investments, as was shown in that chart, had plummeted quite quite significantly to from five million to about 4.2. And now it's recovered again to, I can't remember what the exact number is, but I think we're over the five million mark again. So we've got more than what we originally invested um, and the other thing that I think is quite uh, of, of interest and, and some uh, great deal of comfort, I hope, to members, uh, and it's a point that um, Councillor Barnes has raised several times in the past, is that we want, ideally want to keep these investments going because they do provide uh, a regular and solid uh, return of income for um, yeah, not, not really an awful lot of, uh, a lot of work. The money's working for us, if you like. Uh, thank you very much. Um... Chief Executive, sorry, uh, Chief Finance Officer. Um, I do apologise. <laughs> um, could I open the discussion to councillors for the questions? Um, Councillor Maitley. Yes, mine actually isn't a, a question rather than a request. Can we have the slides forwarded to us? Because it, unfortunately the print was so small I couldn't see it, read it all. Thank you. I'm very glad you've said that. I had intended to say exactly the same thing. Um, I, ha I had the good fortune to have a screen in front of me, but for the rest of you, that wasn't the case. Um, uh, the print really, unfortunately, cannot be read at a distance with a naked eye, although there were some good slides. So uh, it would be excellent if you could forward them to our Democratic Services Officer and uh, who will circulate them to us. Thank you. No problem at all. The, the, thank you, Chair, and the, thank you for the question. The slides are, are with your offices. Thank you very much. Any other questions? In, in that case, I'll ask a question. Um, do you advise uh, Rothers uh, property investment strategy for the individual properties we purchase. So thank you for that, Chair. So, so as a, an investment manager, so we don't provide advice. Um, so we provide information on the fund that you are invested in. So that's not something that we do um, as, a, as an organisation. Thank you. Um, I was interested in the comparator benchmark. How do you uh, create that comparator, or what comparator do you use? Shall I chip in there, Kenny? Go ahead, please. So we, do, we don't um, create it. It's, it's created independently, and it's effectively the aggregate returns of all the pro UK co property funds, your commercial property funds in the UK. So it's it's... It's not produced by us. We take the data from third parties independently. Thank you, Heather. Um, I now call on Councillor John Barnes. Um, and I apologise, I hadn't noticed you earlier. Yeah, um, I apologise in a sense for asking this question because you're still doing better than your comparator. But I have noticed that uh, even though the economy is growing quite strongly, your recent returns have actually been rather lower than they were earlier in the uh, this decade. I wondered if you had an explanation for that and what you're doing about it. 
Thank you, Councillor. So um, Heather touched on, on this point, the overtime. So it may look like our income returns have actually reduced, but as a percentage of the overall portfolio, it may have reduced That's because the capital values have increased over that same period of time. So the amount of money that's coming into your account hasn't changed uh, as significantly. It will go up and down slightly. Um, so there might be some small variation over time, um, but actually it looks lower, but that's because the capital values over time have increased. Yeah, I, I, I guess that might be the case. Um, and obviously, uh, I appreciate very much that our capital value is also uh, going up quite steadily at the moment. I'm not sure I saw any figure for that anywhere. So the, the, thank you, Councillor, for that. I can I can update you on that. Uh, the, the valuation and this was this is a month ago because I haven't actually seen the last one because we're just in our year end processes. Uh, so it was just under five point five million pounds. It's actually slightly more than that now, if I may. It's about five point six six, I think. Yeah. So. And then that, so that's the capital value. In addition, of course, you'll receive yeah, the income you're receiving. I think it's, it's been around about one hundred and eighty seven thousand pounds per year. It's that sort of level. Yes, it, it would be good to have those slides, I think, uh, available to us. Um, they were very informative and I do thank you for that. Uh, there are three people waiting to speak. Um, I'll call um, Tony Baden first, followed by Councillor Mary Barnes, followed by Councillor Richard Thomas. So, um, yeah, thank you, Chair. I didn't mean to jump the queue. I didn't realise there were two people in front of me, so I apologise for that. Uh, I, I, we have got the slides, as, um, as Kelly said earlier. I, I wasn't. I was only knowing whether to send them around before the presentation or not, but I didn't want to sort of uh, spoil the uh, spoil the fun, if you like. But um, I'll get those round to members and apologies for not sending them before. And in terms of um, the, the point that Councillor Barnes has just made around capital values and so forth, uh, we have actually reported those consistently on the in the uh, Treasury Management Quarterly Updates. Um, I can't remember if we put them in the last last quarterly update report or not, but I can certainly put that information again going forward. The interest, uh, so the income that we earn, the uh, the interest income that we earn, that's always reported as a matter of course. So. Uh, we'll continue to do that in the uh, in the next quarter's reports. Thank you very much, Ten. It's really helpful. Um, Councillor Mary Barnes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, thank you. Very interesting. Um, and I just thought, as you were as you were uh, presenting this, that obviously there's a tremendous um, uh, emphasis to to improve properties. Um, but I just wondered if there'd been any kind of knock-on effect as a result of people working from home and whether that had affected particularly the office part of the business. Yes, shall I uh, say a few words? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor, for that. Um, yes, it does. I mean, not, not in a particularly detrimental way. It's something that we are keeping an eye on, as I think I mentioned in the presentation changes in how people work and how they use offices were already in evidence before the pandemic. The pandemic has certainly accelerated that. Um, and we are reshaping the portfolio to reflect that continuing trend. Um, but it, things were going on already. If you think there's still sort of offices, we're finding still people really like there is good use for offices. You know, people do want to use them, but they need to be in the right place. They need to be the right sort of you people actually want to come and work in them so the sorts of places that are falling rather out of favor and were do have been doing for some years this isn't just a pandemic thing we're typically you know the sort of big out of town office parks where you know 600 people would drive their cars now that's a bit of a bad thing these days anyway to some office in you know, the middle of this estate where there isn't much going on you might get a burger van at lunchtime but basically you know it's a pretty soulless environment it used to be a thing um, 15, 20 years ago, this was how people worked. It's much less of a thing now. So yeah, we were all right, already identifying trends like this and reshaping the portfolio um, and we'll continue to do so. Thank you very much. Thank you, Heather. That's extremely helpful. 
Uh, I now call on Councillor Richard Thomas. Uh, thank you, Chair, um, and thank you for that extremely interesting and informative presentation. Um, I've got two questions. Um, the first is, you, you talked about certain sectors which appear to be declining, others obviously going the other way, and I'm just curious to know whether you think there are any sort of subsets of those declining sectors which will still show good growth in the future. That's my first question. And my second question is, you didn't mention, I, I don't think you mentioned, um, investment particularly in green technologies, which got this very, very much um, in the news at the moment, and I wondered if you could say something about that as well, please. Thank you. Okay. Shall I? Uh, do, so, Kelly, were you about to? You go ahead. <laughs> Oh, the, the only thing I was going to say is in terms of um, sort of retail, if we think about retail as a subsector, actually retail overall um, has seen has been seen to be a sector in decline. But actually, if you do then break that down into a little bit more detail, you have the traditional high streets where there has been a lot of um, areas that are struggling and have continued to decline. But actually, there are areas of retail, so such as retail warehouses, and Heather did touch on this, things like that slightly out of town. Um, I think, actually, Heather, you mentioned uh, the sofa shops that we go to, sort of the B&Q. Um, we have those sort of uh, retail parks those have actually still performed relatively well. Um, so, yes, there is um, definitely areas where you would need to look, even within subsectors within a particular subsector, um, to make sure that you're you're watching the market as closely as you can. I mean, Heather, if you've got any more to add, and then I'm going to be cheeky and hand over to you for the next question in terms of green technology. Yeah, well, I was just going to add one more example on the um, subsectors, because we have found a significant trend just in the last couple of years really with uh, sort of retail warehouses that um, some of them haven't been doing that well they've been doing okay but actually there's a good change of use example where people might not no longer want to use this as a you know a, a wix or a tops tiles or whatever um, but the very same people who've got the big industrial distribution warehouses out in the big motorway junctions are realizing gosh you know we get all these huge trucks coming into the outskirts of London. Um, now we need to get stuff around the much smaller streets in the middle of London. How are we going to do that? And the answer is they're taking on these sorts of properties, which have lots of characteristics that are ideal. You know, they're near the North Circuit or rather major roadways. They've got um, huge parking spaces. There's a nice, usually a single storey building with a large floor um, footage. And uh, that's absolutely perfect for bringing your big trucks in and then splitting the load up into much smaller things that could do the last mile, the last two miles of delivery through the through the smaller streets. So um, this is another area where we've been able to add value by you know, properties which perhaps weren't so much use in their original use, but actually they're very valuable to somebody else with a change of use. Um, green technology, well, I mean, remember, this is a, a property fund, so our job is to invest in properties. So to the extent that we're reflecting the shift towards green technologies, that's principally in how we're relating with the lessees, with the tenants, uh, as, as Kelly was saying, and, and what we're doing about the buildings. And I think Kelly gave a couple of examples of our greening of the buildings when we're redeveloping them. And, of course, again, because we have relatively short lease profiles, there are lots of opportunities to do that. Um, so it's it's more a question of how we manage the properties and implement green technologies in them and indeed encourage tenants to do so through green lease clauses. That are, this, this isn't a fund through which we directly invest in the technology. We have other funds that do that, um, but in this, this is a property fund. So our engagement with green technology is really through that, through that lens. Thank you very much, um, uh, Heather. That was very helpful, and yours was as well, Kelly. Uh, do you want to come back on that, Councillor Thomas? Maybe just to say that, you know, there could be things like factories where they make bicycles, factories where they make um, wind turbines, that sort of thing. Um, the, the distribution centres of that kind of technology. That, that's what I had in mind, really. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so I mean, one thing Heather touched on is that we do have um, investments in those kinds of technology, but in, in other parts of, of the business, in other funds that we do have. So as an example, I think probably the best one to mention is something called the Clean Growth Fund. Um, so CCLA has partnered actually with the government department base. And so we actually have put 
um, we've match fund the government to come up with a clean growth fund. And so what this particular fund does is actually invests in sort of early stage, uh, particularly clean, green uh, type technology. And one of those actually is uh, battery uh, related. So we do have other ways that we invest as an organisation, and that does also include um, some of the other funds and the types of companies that we invest in. But as Heather mentioned, that's other parts of the business as opposed to the, the property fund lens that we're talking to you about today. Um, might I ask uh, what percentage of your portfolio is invested <laughs> in the Clean Growth Fund? So the Clean Growth Fund is a separate fund. So it's a fund that's managed outside of outside of this one. So it's not this one. It is a whole separate uh, investment fund that, that we manage. Thank you. Sorry, I misunderstood that. Um, could I ask whether Councillor John Barnes has his hand up from a previous uh, request to speak or do you have something new to, to say? Yes, I was... Just wondering, and it was inspired by Councillor Thomas, I suspect one of the sectors which is going to catch up fast is going to be uh, hydrogen use for heavy vehicles, and they will, of course, need refuelling stations. I would have thought those are the kind of properties we might have in prospect. I wonder what you thought of that. Uh, absolutely no objection. You know, if we see a property opportunity and we think that would be a suitable use for it and there's a suitable tenant, um, then yes, it, uh, absolutely. I mean, we, we wouldn't necessarily actively go out to say we're only going to try and find properties where it can be that sort of tenant. But um, yes, it's, it's, it, we are always looking for areas, again, that, that's part of our commitment to sustainability, thinking about, well, which tenants are in growing businesses as opposed to those that perhaps in less secure businesses going forward. And that would be the growth area, in our view. Um, well, I'd like to. Sorry, uh, I'll um, invite you, Councillor Barnes, for the final question before we need to move on. I thought I'd seen your hand go up, Councillor Barnes. Um, okay, I'd like to thank you, uh, ladies, for your very well-informed and uh, well-received presentation. Um, we've all learnt a lot from it, and uh, uh, we appreciate your time and expertise. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time. No, I very much appreciate it. If we can move on to the next item on the agenda, agenda item six. Um, this is the property investment and regeneration, sorry, the property investment strategy update. And um, I invite the Graham Burgess, the property investment and regeneration manager, to introduce this. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, the, the purpose of this report is really to update uh, the committee on, on the, first of all, the, the process that we undertake when uh, we're requiring assets in, in pursuance of the Council's property investment strategy, and also just to update on activities since the last report to, to this committee, which was in, in May 2020. Um, hopefully, the report is reasonably uh, self-explanatory. Um, the property investment strategy was uh, was updated uh, shortly after the last report to this committee in June 2020 um, and, and that was conducted alongside a, a slight tweak to the terms of reference to the, to the property investment panel. Um, the property investment strategy at, at, at that time the 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 purpose behind the, the review of the strategy was, was actually to try and uh, broaden the scope uh, of the Council's uh, search for uh, properties to acquire through its property investment strategy uh, in recognition of the fact that um, we uh, are fishing in a relatively small pond 
when it comes to looking for investment opportunities within the district. Um, what has happened in practice is that, in fact, the, the, the Treasury have uh, lived up to the sort of warnings and shots across the bows that they've given to local authorities in recent years. Um, first of all, by um, imposing a 1% uplift on, on public works borrowing, um, uh, which has since been rescinded. But they have also very much tightened the rules around uh, the use of public works uh, loan board borrowing to fund property acquisitions. And the effect of that really means that, uh, for all intents and purposes, our scope of search for property acquisitions is limited to, to Rother District. And we have to uh, uh, make a very clear connection between uh, pursuing uh, local economic growth objectives and corporate objectives alongside uh, investment objectives when we're looking at these acquisitions. Uh, and the reality is that, in fact, all of our acquisitions to date have been within Rother District anyway. Um, you'll see from um, uh, paragraph 10 of the report, we summarised the, the acquisitions that we have made uh, as at May 2020 and uh, the ones that have subsequently taken place, uh, including the site at Mountview Street, Bex Hill. Uh, which is uh, a major development opportunity which we're working very closely with uh, the NHS uh, to develop an um, uh, inpatient mental health care facility. Um, and the, the site at Beeching Road, which is a potential development site which we are working with uh, possible operators on. Uh, I can't give too much detail on that uh, in open session. Chairman, but we're in advanced stages of discussions with various parties on that and there will be a, uh, a decision coming forward. And there was a cabinet report in February of this year which sort of summarised where we were with that. Um, uh, in Appendix 4 of the report, I summarised some further acquisitions which are in the pipeline, one of which has, uh, since publication, has now completed. Uh, and together, that has effectively used up pretty much all of the £35 million original allocation that was approved by Cabinet back in, whenever it was, 2018, I think it was. Um, I think looking to the future, um, I think the, 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 the opportunities for sort of big ticket investments are always going to be few and far between. Um, the major one that completed uh, the other day was perhaps the exception rather than the rule. But we will obviously continue to look, look these out. Um, um, we are in regular dialogue with, with local agents who are active in the market and we look out for opportunities as and when um, they come up. We don't necessarily always... Uh, follow them up because they, we, we see them as being uh, too risky or requiring too much uh, upfront investment to make them work for us. Um, uh, but we do take uh, opportunities where we think they're, they're worthwhile to pursue and we take those through to the panel in, in the usual way. Uh, I think the main opportunity that I think we have within our existing portfolio is to continue with our programme of negotiating buying out head leases at Beeching Road. Um, we've done a few of those over the last few years, and that has obviously yielded some quite interesting uh, projects and changes, including the, um, uh, the development, uh, proposed development at Beeching Road. Um, uh, we've got a GP surgery going on part of that site. We've got the Beeching Road Studios project, which is uh, coming forward at a pace. Um, and these all would not have happened had we not taken the initial investment to buy out those head leases. And hopefully there will be further opportunities to do more of that in the future. And that will be down to discussions with uh, head lease holders as we go along. Happy to take any questions, Chairman. Um, may I take the liberty of asking a couple of questions first? 
um, the land at Mount View Street, Bexhill, is that the um, inpatient mental health facility? Uh, yes, Chairman. The majority of that site would be uh, taken up by that facility. Um, we are working with the NHS on an option agreement for that for that piece of land. Um, the remainder is earmarked for uh, primarily residential development. Um, uh, and it's expected that that would probably be taken forward through the housing company in due course. Thank you. That's helpful, um, Graham. Um, can I suggest that while it's, we've got a really thorough report concerning the properties which have been purchased and their capital value, it might add value if at the next meeting and future meetings um, we had some income information and some cost information. Um, I'm talking about annual running costs, annual borrowing costs, and um, a pro projected return on investment on each property. Um, uh, so, sorry, just one second, please. Uh, sorry about the interruption. Um, the uh, it it may it may help to have such a table so that we can see the overall picture. Um, I believe um, the chief finance officer wants to uh, intervene at this point. Yeah, thank you, Chair. It wasn't really an intervention. It was just to say that um, in, again in the Treasury Management Quarterly updates we do uh, we have included um, information of that level in the past. Um, I think what probably will help uh, be helpful to members if we have it in a more uh, composite table, like the one single table, rather than bits of information dotted around the report, so I can pull it together in one table. So I'll, I'm happy to take that forward uh, with Graham for the next uh, Treasury Management Quarterly Update. Uh, thank you very much, Tony. Uh, that's appreciated. Um, I'll open questions to the floor now. Um, Councillor Mary Barnes. Thank you, Chairman. I'd just like to go back to the mental health unit, <clears throat> if I may, because as Robert's representative on HOSC, I was in on the discussions which led to the approval that it would be Bex Hill that would be chosen as the site. Um, but I was just a bit concerned on hearing about, uh, I don't know whether I got the right bit of the message, but I know this is an eight acre site. Um, and then there was some mention of housing. Was that actually going to be on that site? Because as far as I know, because, this, because the, the mental health facility is one which is being moved from the present one at Eastbourne. Those eight acres are being used as sort of um, care for, for care of the of, of, of the patients themselves. I wouldn't like to see any other building going on on that eight acre, but you know, maybe I've got that wrong. Can you just enlighten me, please, uh, Mr. Burgess? Uh, yes, certainly. The the um, the site in total. I don't have the 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 total site acreage in front of me, but um, essentially uh, the NHS would be looking to take roughly two-thirds of the land that we have acquired. They never had an interest in the final third. Uh, that was always part of the housing allocation within the wider North East Becks Hill um, allocation. Um, so uh, essentially what the NHS have said was that they're looking at, I mean, it's a phased approach, so, so it will be a phased option agreement. Um, but essentially, the, the, the two phases would take roughly two-thirds of the site, which is the northern part of the site, uh, and then the council would retain the southern third for development on its own bat. Could I just come back very quickly, Chair, to say how important it is that as much of that site as possible is left for the care of the patients. We're we talking about gardening, giving them access to, to uh, fresh air. I mean, obviously, they're going to be doing other things with them, like taking them down to the coast and that sort of thing. But this is a rehabilitation 
for existing mental patients who've been undergoing some sort of trauma. So that land is a vital part of their of, of, of their recovery. So I'm 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 relieved to hear that it isn't actually coming out of the site that the NHS had indicated. Uh, but I do think you know we need to be very careful that um, that as much of that land as possible is kept green. And certainly there are within the, within the um, uh, planning constraints around the site, there's extensive green buffer areas within that um, to, to buffer the development from, from existing housing and so on. Uh, thank you, Mary and Graham. Um, are you reasonably happy with the answer, Mary, or would you like to pursue that further? No, no. I, so thank you, Chairman. No, that was that was. It, I'm I'm so glad that that Bexhill actually got the site um, because it was um, it was a toss up. There was another site they were looking at, and really, it's very good news indeed for Bexhill. They got it because with it comes the promise of improving the the infrastructure around it, so that improvement in bus services and that sort of thing. And I think they're hoping to look for some of their staff. Uh, from Bexhill as well. So there will be, a, 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 it's a real plus that we've actually got that site for that use. Thank you. Sorry if I had my speaker on accidentally while you were talking just now. Um, Councillor John Barnes. Yes, Chairman, a comment rather than a question. I was looking at paragraph 17 uh, with slight dismay, because I accept what uh, Graham Burgess is saying about the difficulty of managing a large number of small properties, but uh, the property investment strategy and the income is going to be so vital to us. I think we've got to look for uh, opportunities outside the traditional. I, I'm glad we're working with the health service uh, so closely, because I think in primary care, they will need larger centres. And I'm beginning to think that that's an area where it might be profitable to invest. The income is absolutely secure and pretty steady. The other area, which I think uh, an audit committee might be wise to urge on uh, the council at the moment, is um, around the homelessness budget, because you operate on both sides of the budget if you actually acquire the properties. So I think actually we should be driving uh, that program a little harder and faster, because it will produce income, but it also reduces outgoings. And um, if it needs more budget, I think we probably ought to be urging that. Because if 17 is right, then one of the major underpinnings of our long-term financial plan uh, is going to be weakened, not, not eroded, uh, but certainly not as good as we might have hoped. Thank um, you. Could I suggest that um, for Councillor, sorry, I apologise, for Mr Burgess to give us... Uh, detailed explanation on this that we move into confidential session for a few minutes excluding press and public um chairman I'm, I'm, i think i'm quite happy to just answer on on, on a couple of those points on the, on the primary care uh, point i mean w we are working actually quite closely with uh, the uh, primary care providers and the NHS on, on quite a few projects as it, as it happens. So um, there is a, uh, we are working with the um, GP surgery on a new GP surgery at Little Common at the Barnhorn Green site, which we've acquired. So we've got the inpatient mental health care unit at, uh, at, at Mountview Street coming forward. Um, we've also recently let uh, property in Beaching Road to the NHS for provision of a diagnostic uh, centre. Uh, and on the site opposite, which was the former Sharwood site, we have um, 
uh, a GP surgery going in on there with a with a with a deal we've done with a with a developer. So uh, that's quite a few. Actually, quite a few of our projects are involving the NHS in one form or another, which is which is good actually. I think for the council because obviously it's a very uh, secure tenant to have on our books. Um, brings its own challenges in terms of the uh, the bureaucracy uh, sometimes, but that's uh, uh, that's uh, something we all enjoy. <laughs> I think. Um, I think on, on just on touching on the subject of acquiring for for homelessness, obviously that's a separate budget and a separate program. Uh, I don't get directly involved with the delivery of that, um, but I, I know that we have inquired and we are continuing to acquire properties for uh, temporary accommodation, uh, uh, and quite a few actually we completed on a, on a couple literally within the last uh, two or three weeks. So and that process is ongoing. Uh, thank you, Graham. Um, could I ask the Chief Executive to comment? I think actually, just, just to comment, um, I think in some ways um, the homelessness budget and the regeneration budget could be useful partners on that project. Um, Mr Johnston. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just, just to take up uh, Councillor Barnes' um, uh, point, I think they they have the same end result, which is actually to produce either to produce income for the council. Um, you could argue is actually part of the regeneration. In fact, we would argue as part of the regeneration, and actually it's something about as well with the homelessness homelessness area is about uh, reducing our outgoings and our expenditure on expensive. And privately provided temporary accommodation. I was just going to make the point, Chair, that I think it's, it's worth actually noting with a certain degree of pride that we have focused our, um, focused our resources within the district. We are spending public money. I think it's right that we should spend that public money to the benefit of not just the economic benefit, but also the future benefit through regeneration and health-related activity. So I think it's something that members can feel justifiably proud about. Um, there are, it does limit us, but actually I think those limitations may be a blessing rather than a curse in some ways, and that it requires a focus on other things, which Councillor Barnes has, has rightly mentioned, which means working with other sectors, which is just trying to measure that is not just in either economic or regeneration terms, but also in the general health and well-being of the district. So just to make that observation, Chair. Thank you very much, um, Chief Executive. Uh, Councillor Thomas. Oh, sorry. Um, Chairman of the Council, please. Thank you. Um, it's not stating the obvious in the way, but obviously those are all in Bexhill. I'm guessing we are looking as closely as we can outside Bexhill as well for suitable properties. Where the opportunities arise, uh, we will certainly look at them. Uh, Councillor Thomas and then Councillor Harmer. Um, first, I'd just like to start. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to start by echoing the remarks made by Malcolm and by Graham because the combined effect of all these um, things we're getting with the NHS is that Bexley is becoming probably the leading centre for the NHS in the South East thing. That's a tremendous compliment to all the people who've been involved in those projects. It's very significant indeed. Um, my question is to, on, on the, the broad uh, notion of community gain, which Malcolm has touched upon. Um, obviously, there's, I've got a particular interest in promoting the idea of the Sackville Road Methodist Church being safe if humanly possible, for community use. And I wonder whether you could comment upon that, but also upon the more general question of how these funds can be used to enhance community uses of buildings as well as the other ways in which we're helping the community. Thank you. Uh, Mr Burgess. Um, uh, Chairman, yes, I, I, I can't really comment on... on Sackville Road Methodist Church. It's not something that has, has uh, crossed our path as a, as a potential acquisition. Um, I think in, 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 in broad terms, I think 
you're absolutely right. I think the community benefit. Um, I mean, clearly, what we what we provide as a council through our commercial portfolio, and it's the commercial portfolio that I'm, I'm primarily concerned with, um, is actually providing job opportunities. Uh, and we find, for example, we have a light industrial prop, uh, portfolio uh, and and a office portfolio, and they're fully occupied. We can't let them quickly enough. There are businesses out there who need, who need additional premises, which is why amongst the projects that we're, we're delivering is new employment space, for example, at Barnhorn Green alongside the, the surgery scheme. Um, subject to planning, I should say. Um, but um, uh, I think we'd certainly look for, for opportunities to maximise that, that well-being where, wherever we can. And it's, it's defined uh, not just within um, uh, you know, economic terms, but, but wider social benefit. Um, I think in the, in the longer term, when it comes to the, the ongoing management of our portfolio, the, the challenge will be, uh, as was, was highlighted by the CCLA, will be to look at the uh, carbon footprint of our, por our portfolio and how we can look to improve that over time. Um, and that's quite a significant challenge um, uh, because we have you know, ageing stock. But again, with refurbishment, such as we have done at, at the Beaching Road Studios, where we, we've refurbished and re-roofed and so on, we'll look for opportunities to do that where we can in the future. Thank you. Um, Councillor Harmer. Um, so rules have changed and we've got a small area in which to look. So, for instance, in the village our ward, Little Common, we have got vacant buildings and we've had the nationwide, a whole block that's going to auction. Uh, it's been vacant for quite some time now. I mean, is there any way that we could look at the investment and change it to residential? The retail is struggling in Little Common. And we are short on places to live. Is it is it worth a look at the investment? How do these things come to you? You've got your agents. Is this particular agent on the radar, or how does that work? Please, Graham. I mean, generally, um, opportunities come come to our notice through um, uh, through contacts with with individual agents. Um, I think this was not one that came across our radar. I have to say I'm open to you know, suggestions if, if members have properties that they wish to, to look at. Um, obviously, the one thing I would say is that uh, the, um, the allocation that was approved uh, back in, in 2018 has now been fully committed. So there's perhaps a conversation about uh, where we go from here in terms of pursuing the property investment strategy and, and how that is funded. And probably that's a conversation we need to have first before we start looking at individual acquisitions in the future. Um, but that's, that's for, um, obviously, uh, members and the, and the management team to uh, have a, you know, give further thought to. So could I ask, Graeme, who would consider uh, the possibility of moving into residential that Councillor Harmer has mentioned. Uh. Thank, thank you, Chairman. That, that, that would be something that would need to come up through the, through the cap, through a report to Cabinet and on as, as part of that policy that the Council is going to look at. Um, I'm not going to look at Tony at this point in time to get, to get his um, view, but I mean, yeah. Bear in mind that you know, the amount of total amount of money that we borrow for any purpose is very closely looked at by central government. Um, I think we would have to look at if we were if we were arguably putting um, you know, um, commercial into residential. What are our reasons for it? Is it economic gain? Is it housing gain? Um, I think there's a number of, of quite difficult questions. I think the fundamental question that, that Graham has has said earlier is we virtually reached our cap at the minute, so it is, prob it is time for us to review how we go forward and, and, and what, what, what we expect from the future. And that will require you know, input from, from members as well to take that, that policy forward. 
thank you, Malcolm. Very helpful. Um, it's been uh, suggested to me um, by the Chief Executive that possibly we may be running late on time and that we ought to move on to the next um, topic. Um, could I uh, therefore suggest that apart from noting this report, that we make a couple of recommendations. One is the uh, chart with the income and return on investment, which um, uh, Tony and Graham have agreed to put together for the next meeting and future meeting. And the second area is the possibility of moving into residential um, with reasons for it, which um, uh, Councillor Harmer has just suggested. Um, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm not suggesting we make a decision to this effect. It's not up to us to take this decision. I'm merely suggesting that we flag this up as a possible area to be looked at. Uh, I give way to uh, Mr. Johnson. I wasn't asking you to give way, Chairman. I was just going to comment. I think, can I suggest that rather than um, say we look at a particular area, we, we, I think it would be appropriate now that we have reached that, that point where we need to review what we have and what our next steps forward are going to be. So rather than saying looking at something specific, it is about what are we going to do from here you know, under the constraints that, that, that we need to operate under. So it's, um, I'm not saying that that isn't one of the options. I think it would just be probably rather than limit it, we broaden it slightly. Okay. Councillor Harmer, would you be agreeable to that uh, proposal? Marvellous. Uh, in that case, um, I move... The, I don't know if it's appropriate for me to move this from the chair. No, you need to move it from the floor. Ah, okay. Um, I'm advised I need a mover from the floor. Councillor Thomas. Please, yeah. And seconded by Councillor Harmer. Uh, that, does that incorporate those two suggestions, the one from uh, the Chief Executive and mine, or? Sorry, Chair. I'm not quite clear whether the session of the Chief Executive is intended to replace the original proposal or not. It's not. So in which case, you're happy with it incorporating both? Yes? So me, myself as well. Yes. Separately, the chart that I proposed. Yes. Thank you. That, that's unanimous. Thank you. Um, uh, do we now want a five or ten minute comfort break, or do we want to proceed to the rest of the agenda? Is everybody in agreement with a quick break? Um, okay, well, I, I second your quick break, Councillor Harmer. Uh, those... Yes, we, 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 uh, we pause the recording. ...convene the meeting. And, um, well, now on agenda item seven, which is the audit findings report for 2021 and I call on our external auditor uh, from Grant Thornton, uh, Trevor Greenley. Darren Wells. Oh, I do apologise, Darren Wells. Uh, Darren, uh, thank you, Chair. Yours. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, members. Uh, so the audit findings report before you summarises the outcomes of the audit. Uh, last year, we shared the audit plan which set out those audit risks that we would focus on. Uh, and the audit findings report completes that story against those risks. 
I think the the report itself speaks to itself, but there's just a few things I'll bring to your attention. So on page three of the report, we set out where we are uh, with the audit. It's, it is substantially complete and we highlight five or six bullet points that we just have to finish. And those are typically uh, items that are undertaken right near the end of the audit. There is one thing, though, that does have the potential to delay the signing of the audit. And it's the second bullet point about uh, infrastructure assets. This is a sector wide issue that has only recently surfaced and Grant Thornton and indeed all other audit firms uh, are just refraining from signing audit opinions where they haven't yet been given until SIPFA uh, makes a decision about the accounting for infrastructure assets uh, following some challenge by some auditors. Infrastructure assets for rather are material at 11 and a half million. Uh, so it is something that we do need to consider. Uh, man management have provided us with some information on the nature of the spend and the accounting and recording of that spend. And now as we, we just have a number of internal processes that we need to take that information through and to understand how SIPFA intend to deal with the issue that's been raised. So I mentioned that because that does, as I say, have the uh, potential to delay the signing off. If it were not for that issue, then we are at the end point for this audit. The, the quality of the draft statement of accounts presented for audit were of a good quality. What we highlight on page three is one uh, significant uh, error that was identified during the audit around property, plant and equipment. And you can see there that the balance sheet was understated by just over well, one million pounds. We also identified an, an issue with the calculation from the actuary. Uh, the actuary had used uh, in its uh, in its production of its report, the estimated returns on the pension fund assets, but the actual return on those pension funds were higher. So it does uh, alter the net pension liability. Uh, management have decided not to amend the accounts that are presented to you later uh, for this item. Uh, and we would want to seek your agreement uh, to that. Uh, that stance taken by your officers. We believe it's, it, it isn't material. So if if members were in agreement with the decision not to amend the accounts for that one unadjusted, unadjusted error, it wouldn't in itself have an impact on the audit opinion that we would then issue. And at Appendix B, we all set also set out uh, some of the other changes that we've agreed with officers and have been uh, amended in the uh, set of accounts you're about to consider. Uh, the only other thing to, to bring to your attention is that we have shared a draft text of, of a letter of representation. This is, this is what management will confirm to us uh, it's a standard letter of representation. There's nothing unique that we've asked management to make a representation on. And again, that's important for you to be aware of uh, as we seek to complete the audit. I will pause there, Chair, and, but I'm happy to pick up any questions that members may have. Um, are there any questions from members or shall we consider the decision that we've been asked to consider concerning uh, a possible amendment to the pension fund? Do we want to leave it as it is, as recommended by our officers, or to amend it? Any views? So moved, Chair. Leave it. Move to leave it as it is. Second. 
uh, marvellous. So we have um, uh, Councillor Barnes and Councillor Harmer proposing and seconding that we leave it as it is. Um, do we want to discuss this or shall we vote on it? Any views? As there don't appear to be any views uh, to discuss, I'll move to a vote on the proposal from uh, Councillor Barnes and Councillor Harmer to leave as it is. All those in favour? Sorry, that's unanimous. Uh, thank you. Um, are there any other issues, um, Darren, that you want us to consider, which we may have, I may have overlooked? No, I don't, don't think so, Chair. Um, there's nothing further I would add. Thank you. And um, are there any comments on the external auditor's report that councillors would like to comment on? Uh, in that case, is this, uh, is this report for noting or agreeing? Or I'm not quite sure. Um, yeah. Louise, can you advise? Just for noting. Okay. You, have, you have made a decision on the point that Darren has, has raised, so we're... <clears throat> okay. Otherwise, it, it... Uh, can, uh, uh, are we in agreement with noting the report? Uh, that's unanimous. Thank you. Um, in that case, I move on to the, to the penultimate item on the agenda, um, which is the statement of accounts. And I call on Tony Baden, the Chief Finance Officer to introduce it. Thank you for that, Chair. Uh, so, yeah, so just to be clear, because it's, uh, it's quite a long time since it finished, but these are the Statement of Accounts for the financial year 2020-21. That seems like a long time ago now. Um, the first thing I'd just like to, to do, Chair, if I may, is to introduce Ola Jan Janovic. From, uh, she's one of my principal accountants, and will take me to task on my pronunciation of her surname after the meeting, possibly. <laughs> Uh, and the reason I want to introduce Ola is uh, two reasons. Um, the statement of accounts that you see before you, and they've already been before uh, in, in a draft form to committee back in July last year. Uh, as you can see, they're, they're, I think they're about 90 pages long. They're an extremely complex document, and uh, they're very technical. It's very technical in nature as well. Um, and I just wanted to, members to appreciate and, and to uh, realise that uh, the absolute first-class work that Ola and her team have put in to, uh, to putting this information together and, of course, work, working together with our external auditors to get the accounts of the state that they're in now. And uh, the second reason was if I get asked really difficult questions, hopefully Ola can help me out. But uh, just, you know, hopefully the members would understand that some of, the, uh, some of the content is very technical and if there are any questions, it may be that we have to come back to members outside the meeting. But we'll do our best. So uh, members are effectively asked to approve the accounts um, but also to delegate responsibility to, uh, to myself and to the chair uh, to make any uh, minor changes uh, to the accounts should, that, should any arise after today's meeting. And I think um, Mr. Wells in his presentation did mention that there were one or two, you know, that the audit was still ongoing and maybe one or two uh, minor issues to work through. I think he brought to uh, the members' attention the major issues uh, around the um, fixed assets valuation and the pensions liabilities. And uh, the fixed asset valuation has been reflected in the accounts, as have several other minor changes to the notes. So uh, the main things to, to note, really, I mean, this is a standard report. Uh, it, it, it happens every year. We did take the first draft to committee back in, uh, back in July, 21st of July. Um, some members may be familiar or may remember some of the information within the report. Uh, the external audit started much later this year. In, in, in the good old days before um, before lockdown and, and the pandemic, uh, the audit would usually start around August, September time, and we'd wrap things up by Christmas. But uh, I think a combination, uh, possibly, of um, a resource shortage with, uh, with external auditors and the delay, you know, knock-on effect of the uh, delays caused by the pandemic, has meant that the uh, the audit of the accounts has been much later this year than would normally have been in previous years. And uh, 
we don't know what will happen to 21, 22 yet. It's too early to speculate. Um, again, as Darren uh, said in his presentation, the audit is almost complete. Uh, and the, the changes, apart from the pensions liability one that we've just spoken about, that's all been uh, pushed through the draft statement that's uh, in front of members now. Um, just a little bit, uh, just for, for members to be very clear, that the statement of accounts isn't uh, a comment on the council's um, sort of, it's a comment on the council's financial standing, but it's not necessarily the, uh, the same, it doesn't necessarily perform the same purpose as a, uh, a value for money audit, which our external auditors also perform for us as well. Uh, now that report is still outstanding, that's not been completed yet, it's nearly there. It does say somewhere in Darren's report that there are no major weaknesses of advised or identified uh, by that audit. So hopefully members will take um, some comfort from that as well. But it's just to sort of draw differentiation for members between the two, the two documents and their status, if you like, and, and what their purposes are and what they mean to us as a council. Um, and finally, uh, Darren did also mention the letter of representation. I think what we did in 2019-20 and are looking to do again, it's a standard part of the audit process. Uh, Darren's uh, produced a letter. I want to pour over that as Chief Finance Officer and make sure I'm happy with that. Uh, when I've done so, I'll work in, con uh, in conjunction with the uh, Chair of this committee uh, to send our response back to, to our auditors. And once we've done that, once they've received our response uh, in that letter, they will then give us our opinion, which we uh, expect to be unqualified, which is absolutely where the Council wants to be. And uh, any questions, I'm, I'm happy to try and field. Do any members have any questions? Uh, Councillor Palmer. It's not a question because I'm not a training accountant, but just to say I've had a really good look at this. And I just want to say well done. Uh, you've done an awesome job and it must have taken you forever. Thank you very much. And I'd like to uh, reiterate what Councillor Hammer uh, says and uh, thank Ola uh, for the excellent work she's done. Uh, would I be correct in believing that there are no other points that any councillor, either in this room or uh, watching, uh, remotely wishes to make. In, in that case, I move, sorry, no, I can't move the recommendations. I, I, I'm calling for a proposer for the two recommendations that the statement of accounts be approved and that the Chief Finance Officer in consultation with the Chair of the Audit and Standards Committee has delegated authority to make minor, non-consequential changes to the statements. Could I have a proposal, please? Uh, thank you, Councillor Maidley. Could I have a seconder? Uh, thank you, Councillor Thomas. Um, as there are no further comments, I move to the vote on this. Those in favour? That is unanimous. Thank you. Um, I take the opportunity to thank Darren Wells for all the work he has done and for sitting here so late this evening uh, while we covered other issues. And his colleague Trevor Greenby, who's also been involved in uh, the audit, which, uh, as you uh, correctly stated, uh, Darren is nearing its completion, um, but there are still some outstanding areas like value for money. And um, oh, we are happy, um, uh, as we voted, to delegate the final areas to, um, uh, sorry, that was the accounts. Um, uh, we um, look forward to seeing the completion of the audit at our next meeting. Thank you. The final item on the agenda is the work program. Has anybody got any comment on that? Um, 
just scrolling to the final two pages of the agenda. Um, the, uh, the, the next meeting is on the uh, 20th of June. There are 10 items on the agenda. Um, is everyone happy with it? There are no comments. I'll move on to the further meetings on the 27th of July, the 26th of September, the 5th of December, and the 20th of March. Is there anything we wish to alter, or shall we just vote that through? If there are no comments on that, I assume we just uh, accept everything as it is. Um, could I have a proposal for that? Uh, Councillor Harmer, thank you. And a seconder? <laughs> Councillor Thomas, thank you. Um, and could we, could we have a vote on that among those members present? That's unanimous. And I thank you all for um, enduring a two-hour meeting, but some of which I found extremely interesting and enlightening. And I hereby close the meeting at 2024. Thank you.